OK. In this video, I'm going to discuss radians and the unit circle. This video is going to be pitched at beginner undergraduate university students and perhaps senior cycle school students. Beginning with the definition of pi, I'm going to work my way through radians and the unit circle. And at the end, we will have derived the cosine and sine for various angles on the unit circle. Before I begin, I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and I also have a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. So let's begin. Pi is a number which is seen all over life, seen all over science and engineering. And sometimes we can lose sight of where in fact pi comes from. Well, pi is simply a, a definition, it's a ratio. We define pi as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. So pi is said to be c over d, the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. And very quickly using this simple definition, we we're able to get some very useful results. First of all, we know that the diameter of a circle is twice the radius of the circle. In other words, d is equal to 2 times r, the radius. By inserting this into our definition of pi and rearranging, we find that the circumference of a circle is equal to twice pi times the radius. From this simple expression, that the circumference is equal to twice pi times the radius, we are very easily able to extend or move on to the concept of radians. It's much more useful to define angles using what's known as a dimensionless quantity, which means it is one without units. For example, length of course is measured in meters, time is measured in seconds. Angles usually are measured in degrees. They have a dimension. But as I say, it is often useful to talk about a dimensionless angle. Why would we bother to do that? Well, that's not a particularly easy question to answer until you begin doing more advanced science or engineering, and it becomes obvious thereafter. But at the moment, just let's, let's accept that a dimensionless angle is something which is useful. As I said, we currently measure angles in degrees. And degrees, of course, is a unit, it is a dimension. So let's see if we can somehow define a dimensionless angle. We do this by saying we define the, an angle as the ratio of a circle's arc length to its radius. This is theta is equal to L, the arc length, over the radius. How is this dimensionless? Well, the dimension or units on length, on the arc length, is going to be the meter. The length, or excuse me, the dimension or units on the radius is also going to be the meter. And these cancel each other out. So what we're actually looking at is a dimensionless angle. Let's just picture what this means. If we look on the right hand side, we have a circle. Now, it, the length of the full circle is its circumference. If you pick a section of the length, we speak of an arc. So I'm going to give the arc the letter L to describe it, C to describe the full circle's length, the circumference, and R the radius to, des to describe, well, of course, the radius. Now that we have defined a dimensionless angle, namely that theta is L the arc length over the radius, we speak of radians. So theta is now measured in radians rather than in degrees. Now, what would happen if we looked at the whole circle? So let's say the arc length became the circumference of the circle. Or we looked at what is the total, what is the sum of all of the angles in a circle. So if we plugged in C instead of L, we find that there are C over R radians in a full circle. But we know, of course, that C is equal to twice pi times R, and we're able to cancel the R's and we see that there are twice pi radians in one full circle. So that means, as I said, we have two pi radians in a full circle, in contrast to having 360 degrees in a full circle. So where can we go with this? Because, as I said, there are two pi radians in one full circle, 
or 360 degrees in one full circle, we are able to see the relationship between angles in degrees and angles in radians. So I've written some of the more useful uh, definitions of the angles in front of you. This is something you should know. You should know in your own head immediately what is meant in terms of degrees by 2 pi radians or pi radians or pi over 2. The ones down here for the smaller or more less used angles like 45 degrees, 270, 60 and 30 degrees, you don't necessarily need to know off the top of your head, but after a while most likely you will just remember what they are. Now, of course, zero degrees corresponds to zero radians. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. 360 degrees is two pi radians. So half 360 is 180 degrees or pi radians. If we half this again and go from 180 to 90 degrees, we go to pi over two radians and so forth thereafter. In fact, if we wanted to graphically, we could look at it in the following manner. So I've drawn a circle and I've noted, let's say, an arbitrary angle theta here. And the circle lives, of course, in two dimensions. So we have the x-axis here, and we have the y-axis here. So this diagram has all the same information we had a moment ago. Let's start at this point here at zero degrees on the x-axis. So we have zero degrees corresponding to twice pi radians, or zero radians as well. If we go up to 45 degrees, that is equal to pi over 4 radians. 90 degrees is pi over 2 radians. It is very useful to split the circle up into quadrants. There are four quadrants in the circle. So the first quadrant will be in red, the second quadrant is in green, the third quadrant is in blue, and the fourth quadrant is in black. So I was discussing the first quadrant a moment ago. We went from 0 or 360 degrees, or 0 or 2 pi radians, right up to pi over 2 radians. Now if we go into the second quadrant, we have 135 degrees, which cor corresponds to 3 pi over 4 radians. That is simply adding this 45 degrees, this 45 degrees, and this 45 degrees. So you can do the same thing the whole way around we find that 180 degrees is pi radians, that 225 degrees is 5 pi over 4 radians, that 270 degrees is 3 pi over 2 radians, and finally that 7 pi over 4 radians is 315 degrees. What I haven't put in are the, the useful 30 degrees and 60 degrees. The reason I haven't drawn them in there is because it just makes the diagram look quite cluttered. Nonetheless, they are very important angles to understand and be comfortable with. So for this reason, I've written them here. 60 degrees corresponds to pi over 3 radians. 30 degrees corresponds to pi over 6 radians. How do we co convert between degrees and radians? Well, if there are 360 degrees in 2 pi radians, then 1 degree corresponds to 2 pi over 360 and one radian corresponds to 360 divided by 2 pi. Now that we have discussed the concept of radians, it's time to move on to the unit circle. So because we're, I'm introducing the concept of radians, I'm still going to use both degrees and radians to describe the various angles in the circle. If we look at an arbitrary circle drawn in front of you, the circle, of course, lives in two dimensions. You need two axes to describe it. You have the x-axis and, of course, you have the y-axis. Now, any point in 2D space or any point in the circle requires two numbers to describe it. We need an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. So, the important pieces on the circle would be the angle of the, we'll say, at the angle the radius, and the two coordinates to describe the point on the circle. We now require some revision on right-angled triangles. The definition of cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, or the adjacent side of the over the hypotenuse. The definition of sine theta 
is the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. This is illustrated on the top right of your screen. Note that I've defined theta as being here. Now if I defined, let's say I defined alpha being up here, then the opposite would be, and uh, the adjacent would have to swap sides. But for where I've defined theta, the adjacent is here, and the opposite side is here. Finally then, the hypotenuse is up here. Now for reasons you'll see in a moment, I'm going to define the hypotenuse as R. So instead of the hypotenuse, I'm going to write R. For this reason, we can say that cosine theta is the adjacent side divided by R, and sine theta is the opposite side divided by R. If we rearrange these, we find that the adjacent side is r cos theta, and the opposite side is r sine theta. So to say that again, the adjacent side is r cos theta, and the opposite side is r sine theta. We can view this graphically as follows. Where we define the hypotenuse as r, the point, any point on the circle, we'll say any point later on in a circle, can be described as having an x coordinate and a y coordinate. Now, the opposite is r times the sine of theta, and that is, of course, going to correspond to the y side or the y coordinate. Then, r, the hypotenuse times cosine theta, corresponds to the x side or the x coordinate. So this is the, this is the adjacent of theta, and this is the opposite of theta. Because of this, then, we can sub in for x and y up here as having coordinate or cos theta, or sine theta. Where a circle has a radius of one, or one unit, we speak of it as being a unit circle. So that means the points in the unit circle are one, zero, so x is equal to one, y is equal to zero, zero, one, so x is equal to zero, y is equal to one, minus one, zero, x is equal to minus one, y is equal to zero, and zero minus one x is equal to 0, y is equal to minus 1. Any point in this circle has a coordinate x and y. Now we can drop a perp or parallel and perpendicular lines here and create a right triangle. If we note here the right triangle's hypotenuse corresponds to the radius of the circle and that's why I was using r as the hypotenuse earlier on. This allows us to use all of the results of our right triangle, which I've discussed here. So plugging all those in onto our unit circle, we have the following diagram. The radius is still 1. Any point in the circle is still described by x and y coordinates. The x coordinate is the adjacent, so it's or cosine theta, but the radius is equal to 1, so x is simply cosine theta. Similarly, the, the opposite side is r sine theta, but the radius is of magnitude 1, so simply y is equal to sine theta. This means that any point in the circle is simply described by cos theta sine theta. x is equal to cos theta, y is equal to sine theta. Now it's time to start looking at the various angles on the unit circle and see if we can calculate their cosine and sine. So I'm going to shrink the diagram in front of you, and let's move on. So remember, any point is described by cosine theta equals x, and sine theta equals y, where the radius is equal to 1. But that, that describes any point in the circle at any angle. What would happen if we went to 0 degrees or 0 radians? So we brought this black line right down, which I've described here. So we have the black line describing any angle on the circle, and we bring it right down to the x-axis. So we only have one blue line corresponding to one of the, the lines up here. So it should be clear to you that we have no sine component, because here x has the value of 1 and y has the value of 0. But x corresponds to, corresponds to cosine theta and y corresponds to sine theta. This means that the cosine of zero degrees, or the cosine of zero radians, 
is equal to 1, but also that's of course equal to cosine of 360 degrees or twice pi radians. Similarly, the sine of 0 degrees or the sine of zero, degree, 0 radians is equal to 0, which of course is equal to the sine of 360 degrees or twice pi radians. So you can now say that the cos of naught is 1 and the sine of naught is naught. In a similar fashion, we're going to look at what happens when theta is equal to 90 degrees. So we have our arbitrary angle on the circle over here, and we bring the point corresponding to the red dot up onto 90 degrees. So we see here that 90 degrees on the unit circle corresponds to x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. And this of course means that cosine theta is equal to 0. So we can say that the cosine of 90 degrees or the cosine of pi over 2 radians is 0. We can say that the sine of 90 degrees or the sine of pi over 2 radians is equal to 1. So now we can say the cos of naught is 1, the sine of naught is naught. The cos of 90 is equal to naught and the sine of 90 is equal to 1. Let's continue and look at another angle when theta is equal to 180 degrees or pi radians. Once again, we have the circle or the angle corresponding to any point in the circle, and we bring the point here over to the point corresponding to 180 degrees or pi radians. Once again, x is equal to minus 1 here, and y is equal to 0. But we know x is equal to cosine theta, and y is equal to sine theta. And this means that the cosine of 180 degrees or the cosine of pi radians is negative 1. The sine of 180 degrees or the sine of pi radians is 0. On to the final angle which we will do in this manner. Once again we begin at the arbitrary point on the unit circle and we move this point to that which corresponds with 270 degrees or 3 pi over 2 radians. Here on the unit circle x is equal to 0 and y is equal to minus 1. x of course is cosine of 3 pi over 2 and y is sine pi, uh, 3 pi over 2. This means that the cosine of 270 degrees or 3 pi over 2 radians is 0 and the sine of 270 degrees or 3 pi over 2 radians is minus 1. Calculating the cosine and sine when theta is equal to 45 degrees or pi over 4 radians is slightly more difficult. So I've set up the unit circle here even though I haven't drawn the outline of the circumference. We still have of course point the point 1 0 0 1 minus 1 0 and 0 minus 1. We still have an arbitrary point on the circumference of the circle and that's going to correspond to x is equal to r cos theta y is equal to r sine theta. But the radius is equal to 1, so basically y is sine pi over 4 and x is cos pi over 4, as we have seen in the past. How do we actually calculate what x and y are? It's not so simple as 1, 0 or 0, 1 or whatever as we had in the past. By definition, a, an, a triangle with 45 degrees here is made up when the x length and the y length are equal. So for this reason, I'm going to say that x is equal to y is equal to l. And I'm going to use the Pythagoras theorem. So the hypotenuse squared is the sum of the adjacent squared plus the opposite squared. So r squared, the radius, well that's simply going to be 1 squared. x squared plus y squared is simply going to be l squared plus l squared, or twice l squared. Rearranging, we see that the length l is equal to 1 over root 2. So now we can say that x and y are both 1 over root 2. So just rearranging this means that the cosine of pi over 4 or the cosine of 45 degrees is 1 over root 2. And so is the sine of pi over 4 or the sine of 45 degrees. The most tricky angle to calculate the sine and cosine of is when the angle corresponds to 60 degrees in your triangle. How do we do this? Well, we have to do a bit of a geometric argument here. So I'm going to extend or double my triangle. 
So I'm going to take the triangle which is up here and extend it to the right hand side. So we have our 60 degree angle here as we did a moment ago. Well, because it's a right triangle we have to have 180 degrees. That means we have 90 degrees plus 60 degrees meaning that the remaining angle has to be 30 degrees. So with our mirror triangle we have of course the exact same angles. The length will be as follows. Because it's a mirror this one, that was the radius 1. This means this also has a, a, a length of 1. If you look at the two angles up here, they also correspond to 60 degrees. And what this means is that we have a triangle, a bigger triangle now, with a 60 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, and a 60 degree angle. How is this of use to us? Well, we, we've seen a moment ago that every side which is opposite 60 degrees has a length of 1. So this is opposite this angle here has a length of 1. This is opposite this angle has a length of 1. And this suggests that this angle here which is opposite this will have a length of 1 here. This, this side will have a length of 1. This is useful of course because we are interested in this segment of the length which of course corresponds to 1 half. So we found that x here is equal to 1 half. In order to calculate the length of the y side, we utilize the Pythagoras theorem again. The details of which are here, you can go through those yourself. We see that the length of the y side corresponds to root 3 over 2. Putting it all together, we find that the cosine of pi over 3 or 60 degrees is 1 half and the sine of pi over 3 or 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. The final angle we have to calculate is what happens when theta is 30 degrees or pi over 6. It shouldn't be a big jump to realize that this in fact is the same triangle as we had a moment ago but using the other angle namely 30 degrees. So this means that we just need to swap the lengths. So it means the cos of 30 degrees or pi over 3 is root 3 over 2 and the sine of 30 degrees or pi over 3 is going to be 1 half. Pardon me, I just noticed a typo. 30 degrees corresponds to pi over 6. It is 60 degrees which corresponds to pi over 3. Finally so, Putting it all together, we can look at the angle in degrees, the angle in radians, the cosine of the angle, and the sine of the angle. And I've written all of the results of the last couple of minutes there in front of you. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you might also check out universityphysicstutorials.com.